We've been going through Luke Acts here at the church. We decided to do that because uh, it is most important to us that we create disciples. Um, and so we picked Luke Acts to do that because Luke Acts is a two-volume set uh, in your New Testament. So it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then John, and then Acts. But Luke and Acts would have traveled together. They would have been the set. They're both written by uh, the Apostle Luke. They were written down then for a historical account of Jesus, which is the gospel according to Luke. So that's the life of Jesus, his birth, uh, his growing up, his ministry, his miracles, his teaching, his death, his resurrection. And then he ascends into heaven at the end. But before he ascends, he tells his followers to go into the world, create disciples, baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I'll be with you to the end of the age. And so if you wonder, well, I wonder what happened when he said that, that's the book of Acts. And so we've been going through the book of Acts for about a year and a half now. Um, and we are in Acts chapter 20 this morning. Last week, we ended uh, with the riot where in Ephesus they were mad because Paul had converted so many people in the city to Christianity uh, that people were not buying the little trinkets and pretty things that were a representation of Artemis. Um, and so those people who made those things got together and threw a big fit and screamed and yelled for two hours until the mayor told them all to go home, and they did. So if that sounds interesting to you, and you're like, man, I really wish we had that message this week. Well, you can find that online. You can look us up on Facebook. You can look us up on YouTube. Uh, and you can watch old messages. You also can watch uh, old Wednesday nights. So if that's your jam, that stuff is available online, and you can check it out. This week, then, we pick up right after the riot. And I'm going to be real honest with you this morning. Uh, sometimes when you prep messages, they kind of prep themselves. Things tend to work out, and you're like, okay, I see where we're going with this one. Today's uh, message is, was not that way, so you're going to have to bear with. Uh, first reading through it, I'm like, man, this seems like who cares other than the weird story slam between Paul's two. He went here, he went there, and he took this guy and that guy. But then, thinking about it and looking at it, I said, you know what, though? There is here for us this. Uh, how should we act as a church? Are there things that we can pull from this that Paul is doing that maybe we should be doing ourselves because Paul's doing him them and we could maybe live out his example? So that's what we're going to look at this morning. If you've ever been to Vintage, you know that I like to end messages with Go Be That Church. And I thought, well, we'll just do a message called Go Be That Church because we're going to have three different points that don't really correlate all that much with point A builds to point B builds to point C. But... You can look at it and go, these three things are who the church is supposed to be. So jumping in then, in chapter 20, verse 1, it says this. After the uproar ceased, Paul sent for the disciples. After encouraging them, he said farewell and departed from Macedonia. When he'd gone through those regions and had given them much more encouragement, he came to Greece. So Paul uh, sends for his disciples, he sends for his team uh, you'll see in just a minute that Paul likes to travel with groups of people wherever he goes and whatever he does. But Paul encourages them, and then he travels and he encourages the churches he goes to. Which I think is important to think about, that the church should be encouraging. Uh, we should actually, you know, be people should want to be around us. Uh, which hopefully doesn't offend anyone, but that is kind of the whole point of all of this. How is Paul encouraged him? Well, you got to put it in the context of what Paul's dealing with, right? Paul's in Gentile cities, some Jewish cities, but for the most part, Gentile cities. And uh, when these people decided to take a stance against the norms and culture, they faced great persecution. These cultures were driven by false gods, weird religions, weird rituals. Uh, they were very open about sexuality. They did things that were, you know, wild and radical. And then Paul comes along and says, hey, Jesus came. He was the Jewish Messiah. He died and he resurrected. And because of his resurrection, we have access to the Father through him if you believe. And the only thing that he asks is he put, you put to death all of your own desires and your own thoughts. And if you do that, then you can know God. And so these people made the decision to do that. But when they did that, then they took a lot of persecution in the world. Which is how Christianity still works today. You can get online right now and post certain things, and you know if you put them on your social media, you're going to get flamed to death. People are going to lose their mind if you post certain things. You can't say that. You can't believe that. You can't do that. And so as Christians, reading through this and looking at this, you don't say Paul went to the disciples and he gave them 12 talking points to go prove why he was right and everybody else was wrong. He doesn't take them and say, hey, we're going to train you in hand-to-hand -hand combat so that you can go to war. 
with your enemies. We'll stab them in the throat if they have any opinion different than ours. We'll eviscerate them in public forums. That will show them. What's he do? No, he goes and he encourages them. But for encouragement to work, here's what I was thinking about this week. For encouragement to work like what Paul's doing here, people have to be open about who they really are, which is hard for our world because we live in a world where you can't really be open about who you are. Which is really weird when you stop and think about we also live in a world where everybody says just be who you are. Right? What a contradiction that we've created. Be who you are. Nobody can tell you who you are. You discover your own personal truth and you live it out. But then also, on the other side of that, don't let anybody ever see you bleed. Don't let anybody ever see any problems you're going through, any things you're struggling with. Don't let anybody know you're not having a good time. Don't put your problems on other people. That's your problem. Well, how do you encourage somebody that doesn't let you know what they need encouraged for? So first, for the church to be able to encourage, the church has to be honest about who they are, which means we all have to embrace what? The idea that we're all sinners and fallen short of the glory of God, which means nobody in this room is any better than anybody else period. Now, if in your head you're like, I hear what you're saying, Pastor Pat, I really like that, but I disagree. Because you can say all that day long, but I am definitely better than the drug addict. I'm definitely better than the, the person who can't control themselves sexually. I was good and they were bad. No, you got a pride problem. And your pride problem is just as bad as anything somebody did trying to figure out who they are when they made bad choices. You ain't better than anybody else. And you know what you need to encourage? Be humble. Don't forget that even though you think you got it all figured out, if you don't believe in Jesus and you don't follow Jesus, you're never going to heaven either. The only way we come to the Father is through Christ. Which is encouraging. Because what it means then is life stops being a series of checks and things that we have to do to make ourselves presentable to society. All we have to do is believe in Jesus and He makes us presentable. That should be an encouragement to you. And when we read about Paul going into the world and about Paul talking to these churches he's going to, that's how he's encouraging. Is he's telling them, hey, stop worrying about what all these other people think. I don't know how many times in youth ministry I had to have that conversation with people. Students struggle really hard with this, especially junior high girls. Now, junior high girls, I um, had in my youth group, and I tried to love them. What was always funny, though, was junior high girls enjoyed hanging out and bothering me, and I could never figure out why. I even had people say to me, why do they come around you? You're so mean to them. I'm like, I'm not mean, and I don't know, and if you can tell me how to make them go away while they still feel loved, I would be open to those inspirations but it would never fail you'd have a junior high girl come up what is what what is wrong now pastor pat she said my mom was fat my response always was well is she why do you care i'm fat if somebody goes, you're fat, I go, well, you are observant, and you're wasting all of our time because we've already noted this. <laughs> Do you know that when the world attacks you and the world says things about you, the only way that that hurts you or bothers you is if you give credence to what it is they're saying? Why do you care what somebody thinks if somebody doesn't care enough about your feelings to not say things that are hurtful? That's encouragement for you this morning. Stop worrying about what other people think and what other people judge you for and recognize that you believe Jesus died and resurrected. Let's be that church. Go on from there. And then we get this run. So buckle in as I butcher these names. There he spent three months. And when a plot was made against him by the Jews... As he was about to set sail for Syria, he decided to return through Macedonia. Side note here, um, this is funny to me because it's about to set sail, implying that he then didn't sail and he walked and decided to walk back through Macedonia, which was a longer trip. Um, but then when you read through the rest of these scriptures, Paul spends all of his time walking because he's afraid of what they're going to do to him on boats. <laughs> anyway, uh, Sopater the Berean, son of Pyrrhus, accompanied him. Well, that's good. And of the Thessalon uh, Thessalonians, Aristarchus and Secadus. Uh, Aristarchus probably is of noble birth, hence the name. 
Uh, that's how the Greeks like to do things. Your name usually connotated what you were. Uh, so you have Aristarchus, who probably was important and special. But also then you have Secondus, and they're listening together. Secondus literally means two and is a slave name. So if you had slaves, you just named them numbers, one, two. So you have Aristarchus, who's this guy who is important and special, and then you have two, who they're just calling two. And then you have Gaius of Derby, Timothy. Timothy is the guy that uh, Paul writes first and second Timothy to. Uh, and the Asians, Tychus and Trophimus. These went on ahead and were waiting for us at Troas. Uh, but we sailed away from Philippi after the day of unleavened bread. So Paul and all of those guys, they walk. Uh, Luke, he gets on a boat. We sailed away from Philippi, and after the day of unleavened bread, and in five days we came to them at Troas, where we stayed for seven days. So all of that then, what do you take from all of that weird, boring, these guys went here, those guys went there? I think what you can take from it is this. Uh, the church wasn't Paul. The church was a team. The church was a group. Sometimes in our world, when we talk about church, we can get in what they call iconoclasm, which means the worship of an icon, meaning that you elevate the guy that talks or the guy that sings, the gal that runs the children's program. You put them up on a pedestal, and you go, that's their church, and then we all follow them. But what Paul is showing you here is now he's got a whole group of people who are going with them. Who's the head of God's church? God. Ruled through Jesus, empowered through his Holy Spirit. Meaning each and every one of us have different gifts and different abilities than that come together to create the body of Christ. And your gift is no less special than my gift because I have a microphone. It's always frustrating to me when things like that come out and people are like, well, he, he's the speaking pastor, so he's very important. No, he's not. Let me tell you who does the most work for Sunday mornings in this building. Do you not know? Pastor Nathan. Because he's got a herd of turds downstairs <laughs> who range from the age of like five all the way up to the age of like 13. And if you don't know in our kids' church area, he doesn't just do like behavior modification where it's like, be good to your brother and sister. Pastor Nathan takes the same text that we teach and teaches it to your kids. So that then when you get in the car, you, if you didn't know this, now you do. You can get in your car and you can talk with your, hey, what did you talk about today? And it's fun because you heard it in here and then you get to hear your kids try to repeat back to you how Pastor Nathan tried to take it and spin it. If you think I'm struggling this morning with how to teach you about Paul went here and Paul went there, miracle happened, Paul went here, Paul went there, imagine what Pastor Nathan's trying to come up with downstairs. And then he wrangles your children. He keeps your children from killing each other. He takes your children. He does all. And he makes sure your children are safe. That's way more work than me listening to messages and reading commentaries and coming up what to speak. And it always is in churches. It's important you recognize that it takes both of us to make church better. Just like if God gifted you to work with your hands or God gifted you because you're type A and you can organize things. That thing is just as important as the guy screaming on the microphone. If you didn't know, when you see churches that have gotten giant, they've not gotten giant because some guy was inspirational in front of people. They've gotten giant because some guy was able to get behind and over his own pride and get humble and put people in the right positions so that it's equipped to grow and become what God wants it to be. We are not here to push my agenda. We're here to push Christ's agenda. And Christ's agenda is that people are lost in darkness and need to know the truth of his word. And that truth is, he died and resurrected for the forgiveness of your sins. So no matter what dumb thing you did, no matter how bad you messed it up, there's always a way back to being useful and beneficial and full and complete in the eyes of Christ. And that happens through Jesus. And it takes everybody collectively working to make that happen. And so here at Vintage, that's the church we're going to be. Go be a church where every person is valued and has worth and has meaning and is needed. <clears throat> You're not a bump on a log. You're not a silent observer. We need each and every one of you to engage with your world that you live in, engage with the gifts God's given you so that people who are lost can be found. That's the church we're called to be. You go from there into this weird story. <laughs> Three weeks of coffin makes me question God's existence. Anyway, on the first day, 
of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul talked with him, intending to depart on the next day, and he prolonged his speech until midnight. There were many lamps in the upper room where we were gathered, and a young man named Eutychus, sitting at the window, sank into a deep sleep as Paul talked still longer, and being overcome by sleep, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. Now, there's two types of people in the world when they hear that story, and I've learned this over life. There are some people that hear the story about the kid falling asleep in the window and falling to his death that your response is to go, <gasps> and then there's a response on the other side, the rest of us in this world, that we hear and go, <laughs> stupid. Anyway, it's true. Paul's preaching till midnight. So all you all that complain about, I don't like when you go longer than 30 minutes. You need to wake up and recognize. Paul preaches till midnight. Now, he's probably not preaching in this format so much, but he's probably talking back and forth with people about, like, here's what we believe. Here's why you should believe it, too. What about this, Paul? What about that? What about this? Like, it's not like he's holding people captive and they can't leave. They have a hunger to understand what it is that Paul is saying, a deep desire, a longing to know what what are you saying? What are you teaching? This seems really good, but what about this? And what about that? And then you have Eutychus, the young man. It means he's somewhere between the ages of 8 and 14. So he's a kid. Now here's the great thing in the commentaries when you read this. Eutychus, and if you didn't laugh before, you're going to now. Eutychus's name, translated out from the Greek, means the lucky one. That causes such a hubbub in commentaries that some people think the story might not be true. Some people in commentaries say what happened here is because they're only in Troas and for the evening that nobody thought like we should get his name and so when Luke wrote it down he just made it up because that's probably how they talked about him. Right? You remember the lucky one. What was his? uh, Yeah, the lucky kid who biffed out the window, who fell asleep because Paul wouldn't shut up. And if you're Paul's friends, I can guarantee they were making fun of him for it, right? Hey, Paul, remember when you preached till someone died? Whew. So what does Paul do? What do you do when people drop dead? You want to talk about kill a church service. But he does show us something. Because it says, Paul went down and bent over him. Taking him in his arms, he said, do not be alarmed. His life is in him. When Paul had gone up and had broken bread and eaten, he conversed with them a long while until daybreak and then departed. They took the youth away alive and were not a little comforted. Because that's how Greeks talk. We weren't a little comforted. We were a lot of comforted. Yeah, because Paul raised this dude from the dead. When it says he went down and bent over him, in the Greek, a better term would be he collapsed upon him. Now, here's where I want to go with this, and here I was thinking about this morning. How many of us, if somebody were to drop dead in service, the first response would be to go to the Father and not immediately call 911 and be like, we got to get met, we got to do it that way. Not to say either are wrong, but it is to say this when there is a deep discipleship taking place and a deep understanding of who God is and a deep grasping of the power and authority that is available to you as believers, when we face things that are overwhelming, the overwhelming response should always be to go to God first. Which is why here at Vintage, it's super important we create disciples. We have a lot of people in this world who have no idea what it is that they believe. Who say just crazy things. There's this whole thing right now that's going around about how all of these different people were transgender on, in the Bible. And all these different people were gay in the Bible. and all these. Listen, neither here nor there on those, those ideas... But you, that, you can't, what are you doing? And then because of the world we live in, there's no response to those things. You just can say things, put it out there, and then that truth is just in the world. Which is why it's so important that when you understand and you come in contact with someone like Paul, or you find some sort of teaching or some sort of thing that takes you deeper, that you engage it like these people are engaging Paul. He preaches till midnight with them. Uh, Somebody falls out of a window and dies. They raise him from the dead. And Luke can't even take the time to say they raise him from the dead because they got to go back up and take communion and keep preaching. In that early church, 
with the resurrection of Jesus and men who were there and women who were there who saw and experienced that, <clears throat> when they begin to engage with crowds, crowds wanted to know what did you see and what happened. And when they begin to disciple those crowds and begin to teach what Jesus taught and begin to lay out that the last will be first and you should take care of widows and orphans and you're going to be together until the end of the age and it's not about you, it's about you as a collective and you need to love people and care for people and there's redemption at the cost and you got free will to choose Him and you can choose good and you can choose bad, so choose good because when you choose good, you can know God. People had questions. They wanted to know more. And they wanted to know more because of things like this where Paul's raising people from the dead. Because there's power and authority in belief. Christianity is not a philosophy. It's not life goals. It's not a 12-step program. It's not like how to be a better you. Read your Bible and pray. No. Christianity is an understanding how for you to have direct communion with the God who made you. A living, breathing God. Completely other than human. Who is, is and in and around creation. Who holds it all in His hands so that it all works and runs through Him. And He loved you so much, He gave you the ability to have a relationship with Him if you will believe that He sent His Son to die and resurrect so that you could live. That should inspire you to ask God questions during the week I will probably listen to one to two podcasts a day about whatever it is we're preaching on I will spend about an hour to two hours a day in some sort of commentary reading and looking at what it is we're studying I'm not special all of you can do that Every person in this room has the same access to information that I have. And so at Vintage, we want you to have that passion like your pastors have that passion. You should have a desire to go deeper in your faith so that you too can have the power and authority to speak over creation like Paul does here when he says he ain't dead, his life's still in him. Imagine looking at things in this world that the world looks at and says, this thing is dead, that thing is dead, that thing is not reachable, and saying, oh, that's not dead. I know that thing's not dead because God is the giver of life, and I know God. I know God because I'm steeped in understanding who He is because I spend time on my own, reading, studying, listening, and growing in my faith so that I can then engage this world. We talked about the church as a team, but the church also has to be discipled so it knows what it's doing. If you take 11 mediocre football players and you put them with the best coach in the world and you give the guy six weeks and you let him run, get him in shape, teach him a playbook, show him how the game works, and then you go out and you pick up 11 dudes off the street I'm putting my money on the train team every time. I know there's anomalies. I know you can end up with some, you know, Jerry Rice showed up. What do you do? But for the most part, training, persistence, getting into shape, those things matter when you engage in a simple thing like football. How much more so then in a world that wants to destroy you, that doesn't believe in the way you believe, that wants to attack you, how much more important then is it for you to spend time studying and thinking about what it is when you say, I'm a Christian? This is why discipleship is paramount at Vintage. Because I wanted to go that if, you, if I go away, or if Pastor Nathan goes away, or your board members go away, that any of you can step up and be the same thing. Christ is the head of his church. And for that to happen, then we all have to agree and believe that we all have the capability to do the things God has given to each and every one of us. Which means you've got to spend time studying. You've got to do the work. You can't diet for me. I'm fat till I decide not to be. The same is true in discipleship. Like, I can't read for you. 
I can't pray for you. I can't seek God for you. You have to do it. Let's be that church. These verses end like this, but going ahead to the ship, we set sail for Asios, intending to take Paul aboard there. For so he had arranged, intending himself to go by land, because he's afraid of boats. And when he met us at Asios, he took him on board and went to Mytilene. And so from there we came the following day opposite Chios to the next day we touched at Samos, and the day after that we went to Miletus. For Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus so that he might not have to spend time in Asia, for he was hastening to be at Jerusalem, if possible, on the day of Pen- Pentecost. So Paul's trying to get, past, get back to Jerusalem for the day of Pentecost. Uh, at the start of this, he's about 50-some days from being in Jerusalem for that, uh, that celebration. In the meantime, he's hit up all these places where churches have sprung up. Now, I know none of those cities, you don't know where any of that is. But when you go to what they called Asia at the time, which is like modern-day Turkey, and you're in that sea, there's all these little cities that go up from Ephesus where people live. He's stopping at all of those places because the church has spread out of Ephesus to those places. Like there's places in the Bible that nobody went to that the church popped up. Laodicea, the book of Colossians is written to the church in Colossae. Colossae. We don't have like, like it travels and it gets to those places. And so Paul then is trying to touch base in those places so that they can meet him and know him because they've probably read his letters because his letters are traveling around. And so you have Paul doing that. Now, also on this trip that it's not mentioned, but we know from the book of Corinthians, Paul knows that the church in Jerusalem is dirt poor. Not dirt poor how we think about church, right? Oh, the the pastor's bivocational and it's, it's hard, but they're doing the best they can. Church in that time is different than church in our time, especially in Jerusalem. Whenever you made a decree in Jerusalem, I'm a follower of Jesus, you were excommunicated from your family and from the synagogues. So you didn't have work because the whole city's Jewish. So when they say the church is poor, it means the people are poor. They don't have anything. But Paul is going round and round to these Gentile churches and he's asking for money. He's taking a collection that he's going to take back to the church in Jerusalem and give to them. He also, on this trip, writes his letters to the Corinthians, and he writes the book of Romans, somewhere along that line. So he's not just piddling around like riding boats and pointing at things. And that's because Paul understands that the church is not confined to the church in the city it's in. See, we have this idea especially like in America, that each church is its own autonomous little business. And you got to be entrepreneurial minded and you got you to do what you can and make your money and prove why your, your brand of church is better than their brand of church and it's us versus the Baptists. Let's do it. But the early church, that is not the message that is going forth. The early church is when it says the church in Ephesus, the church in Laodicea, the church in Colossae, it's the church in, meaning that there is one church that exists in those places. Do you understand? Saying like, we all collectively, all across the world, those who believe are the body of Christ. And then because of geographical issues, because of maybe different, like, I don't like when they play the guitars loud. Well, I like loud guitars. Okay, well, you go over there and I'll go over here and we can both worship, but we're still part of one church. Why is that important? It's important because you have to keep Christ the head of the church. If we create a church where we have individualism inside of it, then it bleeds iconoclasm and you're worshiping people again. We worship Jesus. Which means then, we should be helping other churches. If you don't know about Vintage, we try not to start programs that other churches do. Because they do it. Right? New Life Pregnancy Center has an incredible thrift store. So when people call me and they go, hey, we have stuff to donate. What should we do? I say, take it to New Life. They already have an established ministry. We don't benefit anything from that. Right? Like, I don't, people don't, like, they don't promote us there. There's nobody that's like, where did you come? Vintage. Well, here's their card. Make sure you go on Sunday and make sure you tithe. Thank you. That's not what it's about. Either you're a business and you're trying to make money, and you're marketing Christ, 
or you're a ministry and you're trying to reach people who are lost. Meaning then if you want to be the most effective, if somebody's already doing something you're doing, then get out of their way, pay them, support them, and help them do what they're doing well. Because we're all collectively the church. There's not a space inside of church for the pride of I'm special because look what I did and look what I created and look what I grew. You didn't do anything. Nobody got saved because of you. Nobody came to know Jesus because of you. Nobody changed who they were because of you. Do you really believe that because of what you say or what you preach or what church you attend is somehow you're more effective in your faith than the guy who's not? <coughs> you're not. Well, Pat, Pastor Pat, my grandpa's church is so boring. Don't go. You don't got to go there. Go someplace where you get fed and you're a disciple, but that doesn't mean they're not disciple and your grandpa. And it doesn't mean you shouldn't support them, pray for them, and believe in them. Because we are at war with the enemy of this world, not with each other in different buildings. We are not competing with other churches. We say all the time, if you're going somewhere, go there. If you don't like it there, you're mad at leaders, then don't be a bump on a law. Find some place where you can worship and be happy and go there. And invest there and be there and give there and love there. Invite people to be there. But we're not here just to push around a big ball of Christians from one church to another church to another church and be like, this is a church now where nobody's angry, but give it a minute. We'll be mad, then we'll go somewhere else. Our job and our call is to present the gospel in a way that people who are lost can be found. And I hope this morning as we talk about going and be the church, you understand that is the heart and the passion of Vintage Church. I don't care about people in Christianity who've been steeped in Christianity, who've done Christianity their whole life. I don't care whether or not they are the ones who come to church at Vintage. If you do, God bless you. I'm glad you're here. We're not a country club, though, and I'm not here to cater to you, and we're not here to create something that makes you feel comfortable. This is a training ground and a place that we're going to push you, make you uncomfortable, and teach you what it means to be a follower of Christ so that you can get off your rear end and go into a world that's broken and interact with people that I can't interact with so that they can see Jesus in your life living and breathing through you because if they don't, they are going to march into hell and you are going to be responsible because you didn't share your faith with them. But Pastor Pat, I don't know what to say. You ain't got to preach. You ain't got to scream. You ain't got to yell. Sometimes the best Jesus people see is not you saying something. It's you loving them. It's you encouraging them. It's you being there for them when no one else is. It's you never giving up on them. It's you every week saying, hey, where are you going to church? You should come to church. Every week I have edge kids I text. Get your rear end into church, and every week they don't show up. But I ain't quitting. I'm going to keep doing it because I, that's my circle. Those are my kids. Those are people I want them to come back and be where God wants them to be because this is not philosophy. This is the understanding that you can know Jesus, and you can know Jesus by believing, and you believe when someone tells you how to believe. And that happens when Christians are discipled, and they understand they're on a team, and they go in the world to reach people who are lost. Meaning that we're going to do our best here, and they're going to do their best down the road, and they're going to do their best over there. And all across this world, every church is going to do their best because we want people to know Jesus. And if you don't like that, and you don't want to be on board with that, then you don't understand Christianity and you're in the wrong place, go find a country club to be a part of. That's God's church. That's who we're called to be. We are in the last hour and we are at war with a world that doesn't want us to preach and doesn't want us to teach. They want us to be silent and not talk about the truth. What I'm challenging you with this morning is know your truth. Read it. Understand it. Steep yourself in it. And then get up on a rock and scream it to this world because this world needs Jesus. And until they have Jesus, we'll keep screaming it. And I'll keep screaming at you to scream it. Let's go be that church. Let's pray. Lord, I come to you this morning. And I thank you for our time together. Lord, I pray that this message will be a challenge to all of us on what it means to be a follower of you. That, Lord, church is not something that we do. It's something that we are. Lord, I pray that as we seek you this week, as we step out in faith, as we find new ways to be discipled, new things to read, new things to listen to, new things to think about, that in those moments you would speak into our heart and speak into our mind. 
Lord, I believe that we are on the edge of a great move of your power and your authority in our church and in our section of your body. And so, Lord, I just lift up this time with you as we steep in you. Lord, this time that we'll spend studying about you and learning about you and understanding you, Lord, as we become adults in our faith, Lord, I just lift this time up that you would begin to move your spirit through this. That, Lord, you would not leave us at just a place of education, but you would take us to a place of experience, that by understanding who you are, by building the foundation of what it is we're called to be, that you would make us up into a monster of a team to go to war with the enemy of this world. Not with people, Lord but to go to war with the enemy of this world that wants to lead people away from you. We know you are knowable. We know you love us. We know that you have a way to understand us and to teach us and to reach us. And we know you love us as we are and you have a perfect plan for us. And so, Lord, today I lift each and every person up in this room that first and foremost you would encourage them greatly. That you would show them they're not garbage, they're not junk, they're not useless. They they have a place and they have a purpose and they have talents and they have gifts. And then, Lord, I pray that you would bind us together as brothers and sisters in Christ. Make us into a team. Use us effectively in this world, Lord. Help us to be bold about our faith. Help us to be wise about where we step out. Help us to be wise about what it is that we do to reach those who are lost. And then, Lord, I pray you would make us into disciples. Disciples that resonate in a place where we say that's not dead, but it's full of life. Lord, I pray that with our understanding that you would take us into the deep places of you. You would expose your spirit to us in a way that only we understand because we've spent time studying that spirit. And then, Lord, I pray you you would use us in our spot in your church in this world. Lord, help us to find ministries that we can help. Help us to find missionaries that we can support. Help us to find things that we can be a part of, Lord, because your church is global and we are a part of it and we believe that salvation is for all people. It's in your gracious name that we pray. Amen.